Excuse me. Cook. Alicia Hammock. Jeff Sargent. Lisa Novak. Derek Kugel. Karen Moy. Troy Bollinger. Denise Conrad. So. Don Robertson, uh, Interim Director of Community Services. Thank you. Um, do we have any citizen <clears throat> comments? No. On issues and items not on the agenda. Great. Moving on. We don't want any of those contests. Don't talk. Our community. Didn't mean that that way, but that is funny. No. <laughs> Good Audio game. and live streaming tonight. Yes, we are. Um, <laughs> Speaking to the general public, we are not normally usually like this. We're a little punchy because it's been a rather long evening for us. Uh, starting off with presentations, do we have any presentations? No. Item four, and item five, moving to item five on our agenda, general business. Item 5A, the proposed trail alignment for Gartner Middle School. And uh, looks like we have some documents here. Okay, and, and who will be speaking this evening regarding that? If, if you'd allow me to, to do a very quick introduction mm -hmm. on the topic, and then I'll turn it over to um, Alice Weiss, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. Kelly, to, to illuminate further on my comments. Great. Uh, recently, staff was contacted by uh, Kelly from the planning department uh, regarding an issue of a trail alignment proposed for the uh, Gardner Middle School as a part of the reconstruction project. My understanding is that uh, the school will be building a new Gardner Middle School and then removing the old Gardner Middle School and replacing that with sports fields that they'll be losing during the construction of the new Gardner Field, Gardner Middle School. Uh, within the, the Parks Trails Master Plan, um, and transportation plans, there's a, a call for a trail connection through that vicinity or through that area. Uh, proposed within the, the site plan is a route to go through that. Um, and there were some uh, issues and concerns regarding that route and uh, amenities associated with that route. Um, the question became, does uh, the PRAC wish to provide comment to staff, both uh, planning and park staff, uh, regarding any suggestions or concerns or uh, ideas uh, for the improvement of that route or for the locations or amenities associated with that route. Um, with that, I will ask uh, Kelly if you wouldn't mind sure. uh, expanding on my comments a yeah. little bit. Um, here. Mm -hmm. Denise, is it possible yeah. to bring up the um, Circulation plan that is on the agenda. I haven't touched this in like three years. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you all, all have it in front of us. Yeah, we right. have it in front of us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of low tech over here right that's now. Fine. Um, so, thanks for, for having this on your agenda. Um, I reached out to Don uh, to, you know, gain some insight from people who, you know, design and build and manage parks and trails for a living uh, because that's not my expertise and it's not really um, anyone anyone else who's working on this project's expertise and so we wanted to get some advice um, so the transportation system plan shows a shared use path project number s40 that crosses through the gardner middle school property um, the so the parks and tra the trails master plan shows that connection as well. Um, so with the redevelopment of Gardner Middle School, this is the opportunity to actually build that pathway, and the school district um, has um, included that in their redevelopment site plan uh, for the project. Um, the uh, TSP, the transportation system plan, shows the connection going from Hood Street to Laurel Lane, where there is a, there, Laurel Lane is a dead end street on the uh, east side of the school property. Uh, and from the, the street, there's a um, pathway that uh, goes between two houses and it um, opens up into the school <coughs> field. Um, so it's a way for, you know, kids to walk to school. 
um, from that neighborhood. Uh, and so the path would come through the site and connect to Laurel Lane. Now, the school um, clearly has you know, security um, needs, and uh, they have shown the pathway along the northern edge of the property so that it doesn't bisect the property, um, and it can be um, more or less separated from the main school uses in the, from the building. Um, so the, instead of cutting through the middle of the site, the path is shown on that northern edge, uh, starting kind of at Ethel Street, and then um, moving along the northern edge, and then going over to the east to that Laurel Lane uh, connection. Uh, the um, so along the northern edge of the property, there would be some tree removal to to make room for that pathway. Um, and then, if you're looking at the circulation plan, there's a curvy path um, that is next to the straight path that's right along the property line. There would actually be a, a connection there. Um, so Wes Rogers has assured us that that connection would be made so that if someone is coming through that Laurel Lane path, they can get to the um, that circular circular kind of round pathway that then leads down could I, to could the site. Can I interrupt site. just a minute? Uh -huh. it's, um, really, because there's so many pictures here of paths and so forth, I'm not yeah. even sure where we're, what we're talking about. <laughs> I believe it's the aquamarine <clears throat> one on the top. Is it... Um, is it behind the new proposed field? Yes. Okay. It, it would begin at, if you look at the, the new proposed soccer field, um, and, uh, if you follow down from the sprint lanes on the, the track that goes around the soccer field. Could you field. hold that up a bit, Nair? Yeah. We can bring it up on the screen. Yeah, let's do it because I think that'll be helpful. Yeah, I think it's uh, where I'm getting lost is this. I think this is the new design for the school. Yeah. And like in my mind, I'm thinking of what it currently is. Yeah. So understanding directionally where we're talking about. Can't, can't, I can't read the street names for one thing, and uh, that's probably my eyesight. Oh, there is isn't. You can see the Hood Street. Yeah, Hood, I can see what probably is Hood Street, because it says Hood, 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 Hood Street bus stop. Okay. This, and this is Hood Street. Pedestrian circulation. Oh, yeah, I gotcha. My only idea is, is where is, is this... Is this the, is this where the school is now? No. Or are they moving it? Because they're working on the school now. Shows right. See the blue, the blue where the bus pickup is. Yeah, this is where they're moving into. This is currently sport fields. So Doug, you see the blue. So the fields over here, or the schools right here, and this is the sport field. So they're just flip flopping. Pretty much here. Uh huh. And follow the rest. Okay. Gotcha. So was that Yes. Okay. Yes. And then follows the fence line. Oh. Like that. Oh, that's the trail. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. I'm just trying in relations to where, and I'm directionally well, challenged. So north. I think south. they're flip flopping the the fields in the school. Right. Okay. So Currently, the school is over here. Okay. And the fields here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So rebuild the school here, and then rebuild the field there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. You guys see that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right along with that. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yep, there we go. Um, you can, does the pointer, yeah. can it be traced to the pointer? Oh, that helps. Just, I think I understood what you're saying. Okay, so. Uh, right now, school building is here, yep. right? The track is down here. Right. So it's going to be flipped. And so this is uh, Ethel Street, and this is Hood Street. Okay. Um, so right now, the cars and the buses come in on Hood and kind of go in front of the school and then go out on Ethel. That's the circulation. Um, so that's all going to, the buses are going to be here. The cars are going to come down here. Um, and the bike and pedestrian access, is, main access is going to be down here. As well. <coughs> so Ethel Street um, won't really be used a, a whole lot anymore for vehicles. Um, 
So the pathway that we're talking about would kind of hug the north property line and come up along mm -hmm. the north property line edge and then go to this Laurel Lane pathway. And that okay. cuts through um, a wooded area that's between two homes. And then you're on Laurel Lane. Okay. You can walk north. Um, so the, the on-site circulation, kind of all these little pathways shown here throughout the site to kind of connect all the different areas, um, what I was saying is that this, if you're coming out of this pathway, there will be a connection right there. Um, so that uh, that's all connected. Um, so you walk to so like, another walk. path that's not illustrated on this. Yeah, that okay. th that's missing from the map, but it okay. will be there. Uh -huh. um, so the questions really. So just to give you an idea of um, normally uh, when we um, have. Uh, developments that have to provide access ways or walkways, um, we have very prescriptive standards of, you know, it's seven feet wide and it has landscaping on either side and it has lighting. In this case, this uh, pathway wa is shown in the Trails Master Plan, which has kind of different design um, guidelines. And so um, what the, the district actually looked to the trails plan for guidance on what this trail should actually look like. Uh, and so what they've proposed is eight foot, eight feet wide uh, uh, pavement with a gravel shoulder on either side. Um, and so this, this pathway here would be eight feet wide. And then um, just so along the northern edge it's basically a bunch of backyards so backyards with six foot wood fences for the most part um, so it's going to be right along the, um, the that edge there um, the district um, in the proposal didn't include any lighting um, so i think one of our questions is um, it, you know the hours of the path um, and if lighting uh, would, cre you know, normally we would require it. Um, and the question is, you know, should we, would that make it a safer path? Um, you know, should that be required? Um, and, and I'm sure Wes is here to, you know, can provide more information too. Um, but, uh, so lighting also, knowing that the school, um, wants, you know, security um, and, you know, wants to keep um, people that don't belong on the school property off of the school property while the kids are there. Um, they, uh, one of the options is to put a fence along the inside of the pathway. So somewhere in this area here to separate the path from the remainder of the property. So if you're using the path, you would be kind of in between this fence on the school side and the fences on the for the backyards. In a corridor. In a bit of a corridor, right. Um, so knowing that that might not really be the best kind of trail design, um, the uh, another option is to uh, close the pathway during school hours. And so it would not be available for public use during school hours. Um, so a, a few, so we'd like your, your opinion on those options. Um, and then w if we get a little further into the weeds about the hours, um, I know parks hours are generally 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. So should that be the hours of this pathway um, minus school hours potentially? Um, and then the uh, Wes also pointed out that you know the track is going to be used for track practice after school. So should the public be able to use the path just um, even uh, during the if there's athletic practices after school, or should it also be closed during that time as well? Um, so I think that summarizes all the kind of outstanding issues um, that there are, and and we. Um, so this whole project is going to planning commission in a week and a half. So the planning commission has the ultimate, uh, has the decision-making authority on the overall site design. Um, but uh, you know, the, if the PRAC has comments, then those would be part of the record and the planning commission would hear um, 
any comments that that you all have as you know what as part of what they review um, later this month. I have a, okay. I, you know, a, a corridor of that length just simply isn't that safe. No. Um, I would be extremely concerned for anybody, especially a, a young child or a, a mother or, you know, somebody that's uh, disabled or whatever, uh, to be walking along that length of a corridor and be uh, confronted and maybe somebody behind uh, trapped with no no place to go no no uh, recourse to that so that that would be very concerning to me that that would be um that that situation would be there the the other thing though i think um closing the path during school hours is probably the, a reasonable option except for those that are maybe looking to use the path in the neighborhood during daylight hours there may not be that many but there's going to be some um, you know there I don't see a good solution to this but I don't think fence a double fence situation is acceptable in any case whatsoever from a safety standpoint I have some questions, and first I want to ask questions just so I understand what's being asked, kind of in my terms so that it works with my brain. Red line is the property line. Yes. Inside of that, it belongs to the school district. Yes. Outside of that, is the city already a path before we get to the fences, or the, the wooden fences right on that line? The wood fences are... Um, on the property line, so the, okay. the there is, so there is no city property in here. No. Okay. So what there is, the, so these are there are two cul-de-sacs up right. north of the school, and there is a little pathway that connects the end of the cul-de-sac to the that. school right okay. here, and there's another one right here. I think this is Ryland Lane, and then this is Haley Court. Okay. And they both have those little narrow pathways that connect okay. the end of the cul-de-sac. And then those black lines are just the property lines of the other homes, yes, right? Okay. that's correct. So the red line then is the property line, and then the two black lines, those are the setbacks. Um, if I'm looking at the legend right, those are the setbacks for the walking path. That's the gravel on either side, right? Yeah, I'd have to zoom in. The two black lines um, with the blue dashed in the middle of it. Yes. That's just outlining so the that, outside of that gravel. I think that's curve, outlining the, the pave, pavement and then on either side of that. Okay. That would be two feet of gravel. Okay. And so then in, so, so this is all school district property. It is. And so I guess, so if I understand right, what you're asking is we have a few options here. Put a fence on the inside, which is designed to keep people off school property during school hours and protect the children. Right. Okay. But if we do that... Um, then the question is, do we have gates closed during school or not? Um, my thoughts, similar, the corridor creates issues. However, to me, a bigger issue is wide open space to access students in their play area. Right, because if you don't have a fence, then people walk in, walk on, walk off. Yeah. Right. So the closure, um, if the if the path was closed to the public during the day, there would be gate locked gates at the ends of this pathway right here, this pathway right here, this path uh, connection right here, and then also at the dead end of Ethel Street. Um, so that's all proposed to be fenced and gated. Um, and those gates would be on timers, I believe. Um, and so they would just be timed to be unlocked after school hours. So it's just, it's a gate that has a regular knob you, to go in and out, but the timer locks that. Is that how that works? Yeah. It's not an open and close. It's more of an unlock lock type timer. Okay. So um, it's, yeah, it's a, I guess it, is the reason that they want the, the fence on the inside for uh, to have a separation between the public and the students is that that's the main reason right yeah and then where does the lighting come into play uh so you know the it, parks and uh, other parks and trails in the city are open till 10 p.m um and so our standards for uh, some of our pedestrian pathways are that they be lit um, at night uh and so this pathway could be treated as one of those pathways that needs lighting or, um, or not. 
Uh, so, are we in a position to require that since it's uh, so the plan, private property? The planning commission can require it, oh, and they can. you can yeah. you can uh, give your advice to the planning commission. I mean, I'm all about safety for the students. At the same time, I'm also not interested in requiring things that are not required. I mean, we've got alleyways throughout this entire city behind homes that are not required to be lit. They're gravel. Some of them are probably private. Some of them are public. Some of them are probably half and half because of setbacks and, you know, mixed up lines and everything else. I don't know if we want to get in the business of telling private property owners they have to light something based on public requirements. Um, although I do like the safety aspect, I guess my comments would be encourage the district to find a way to be safe and light that. But I don't know if I would be interested in requiring it I, I, because that's their private property. Well, but let's go back a little bit. It's okay. not private property. It's publicly owned property that houses a school. Okay, fair enough, but not city owned. Maybe I should rephrase, not city owned property. Um, and so our regulations are built for city owned properties. I, I, don't know, I just, I go back and forth because I'm not, I don't, I think sometimes we wield power we don't have. Um, and so I don't, I don't feel comfortable requiring they do something that is not city owned property. Yeah. Um, but I think we can strongly encourage that they do it. And I think their interest is in making sure the kids are safe. So I don't think that's going to be frowned upon. No, I'll, I'll, um, I'll but I do, I do appreciate, I hadn't thought of, but I do appreciate the, the concern about the corridor aspect and how it potentially, um, yes, it keeps people away from the kids, but when if something happens within that corridor, it locks it within that corridor and eliminates the potential for uh, escape, if you will. Very dangerous. Um, and that creates an issue. Uh, putting things on timer, I think, can minimize that because it keeps people out of there during school hours. But then what do we do after school hours? Do we open it up so that people can use that walking path at 9 o'clock at night and now we have a corridor issue? I don't know. On that piece. Okay, Doug, I think you are next. And then, yeah, I'm going to request that, and everybody else is raising their hand. Don't jump in. You go through the chair. Anyway, um, uh, first of all, the connectivity, I think, is really important. Uh, I guess my concern is secondary, even at night, when it looks like people that are using that path could get access, and this is more for the school district, but it can get access to the other paths and so forth. And uh, if you have vandals coming in, doesn't that en enable the, the, the people to get into these other pathways and so forth that you have in here and not necessarily be observed by monitors or anything? You want me to use the microphone? Yes. So, I mean, this is more of a school district concern, and so, and less of a, of our... Normally, Kelly and I are talking to each other. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, the, the campus does not have any, what you would call, intermediate security fencing. So, once you get on the site, um, of course, the building has some areas that are fenced off, the play courtyard and some outdoor classrooms. But, you know, once you get on the site, you pretty much have free roam around the site. That's true. And at this point, the uh, you could always go out the front entrance, which is down in the lower left-hand corner of, the, of that as well. So the idea being that people could circulate around the site on the weekends, um, in the evenings, um, and so forth. It, it's and not going to be that, closed. Is that a concern for you all? Um, I think at this point, we're willing to work with the community. I mean, if it became a concern and we had incidents that were documented of, of damage to the school district property. We would first look, work with the Oregon City Police Department and so forth, but if it continued, then we would have to come up with some other ways to okay. secure the property. I mean, that's, that's the only positive thing I see about the fence, is that, you know, it, it doesn't permit access off the park into other areas. Of course, they get access to other areas from other places, too. Um, I, frankly, because that, that, that path is so long, uh, I really think that um, lighting is a good idea, uh, and even even though it's it's not city land, uh, uh, it, it looks like it's a fair distance to walk without it being lit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Anything else, Doug? No. Care. Okay, and I will say, um, Wes and his team made a presentation to the Rivercrest Neighborhood Association mm -hmm. meeting 
wasn't hugely attended, but a lot of interest. Um, neighbors didn't express any concern, really, about this. Um, we were aware of the design plan. Um, the one thing that does strike me a little bit, this is your property. And after dark, walking an unlighted concrete path, you probably don't want that liability. <laughs> I'm not sure you really have to make them put lights up. It's just safer. But um, I'm understanding the corridor concept, but I'm also in favor of the school being more secure. And I guess I looked at the fencing, and you can see through it. And I didn't stop to think about escaping through it. Um, are there any intermediate gates along the run of the north side? The only, again, as, as shown there, on the inside, there would be our fence line would be a solid fence line all the way around that path. The only escape points would be those um, exit points um, that go into those cul-de-sacs. And otherwise, you're on Ethel Street at the end of Ethel, or you're over on the cul-de-sac entrance on Laurel Lane. So there's really only one <coughs> Laurel Lane's an exit. And then you got Rylance and Haley Court. Yeah, one, so there are two, two three, three, four. And you have a, you have a, we call it a blind corner in the upper right-hand corner. I mean, that's, that's my concern from a safety standpoint if i was a public user of the path it would be as you can't see around the corner there so you don't know what's hiding on the other if there was something around the corner that would be where i would be concerned because you don't have a good line of sight straight down the path mm -hmm. because of the corner on there so that was a concern of ours and just for the sake of public disclosure we have built another path where we did light it that's the path between the high school campus and the community college mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's lit and so far it's been it's been a, in that situation it's been a good arrangement I think we've not had you know, um, very much I can't even remember a reported vandalism there we've had people leave uh, furniture oh yes <laughs> <laughs> so we only have to do a furniture thing up there but otherwise um, it's it's worked out very well and I think the lighting there is um, appreciated because we do have people taking evening classes at the college and so forth so that one makes a lot of sense um, we do have concerns about after 10 p.m. And, and we operate our stadium, the sports stadium on uh, over on Jackson Street and 12 by the old campus. That is on. That, those have time gates, and those are time um, park hours, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Because we just don't really want people on our campuses if we can avoid it after a reasonable amount of time, and we think that's pretty reasonable because we do have people who like to run on our on our tracks and walk in different conditions, um, and so we try to make them available to the public as much as we can. Well, I think I'm leaning against the corridor idea. Yeah. Um, no, Eric, I think was next, yeah. and then Jeff. So as I understand it, though, the, the campus isn't secured with a fence all the way around it. Yeah, we've tried to stay away from that institutional feel of that, but it is um, where we're talking, it will feel like that. The only place where you won't have secure fencing or the equivalent of secure fencing is down the lower left hand corner when you start getting to the main entrance and the entry plaza well i see no like i said the corridor thing i think is an ethic waste of money I, if you have a bad guy they're going to come onto the school grounds through the parking lot mm -hmm. not you know why they're not going to have to walk around the path um the lighting i had concerns on that um i don't know how many of these neighbors are actually going to love having a light in their backyard shining through their windows all night could be, a, could be an option or a problem. And when I look at this, you know, again, as far as the security, I, you know, I'm all for security, I guarantee you that. Um, but it, it, to me, it, 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 what's the difference between this and Gaffney? With the, you know, they have a, essentially the same type of path all the way around it, totally unsecure, I believe, if I uh, It's can. unsecure. I don't believe it's paved. It's no, it is it's not. not. It's not a hardscape. No, um, th and this one is meant, um, I think the one at Gaffney is kind of meant to be like, a, we call them a path around the sports field. Yeah runs kind of like that whereas versus this one is a connecting pathway for public use specifically built for public use um, now our students will use it when they arrive and dismiss and so forth um, the entryways out to the cul-de-sacs and so forth but 
This is meant for public use, specifically to support public use in a pedestrian pathway, whereas the one at Gaffney is sort of used by the school for public uh, physical education, you know, walking, running, and so forth, just like we would use our track here. So um, there is some commonality, but I wouldn't say they're exactly the same. Um, <coughs> And we don't typically have these kinds of amenities at our elementary schools, as far as a track and a, and a football field, and then a, a small soccer field um, and other uh, grass play fields. Okay. Jeff? If, if you didn't build the fence inside, uh, what would be the hours that the path would be closed? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, our normal uh, school day, and I, I don't want to bore you with all the school calendars, so I'm assuming we all know generally when school starts in the year and when it ends, so I'll, we'll say all summer it's open, unless we have an organized event where somebody's rented the field right. and then they want to have secure those from other users for a while. So uh, for school use, it's generally right now, I would, I would say we'd open the gates at 8 a.m., um, we could open them earlier, but for school use, it would be 8 a.m. So um, at 8 a.m. is probably when we would start the closure. So up until then, if we did park hours, we could open it from 6 a.m. to 8, 8 a.m. The question, of course, is this time of the year, you, it's dark. Mm -hmm. So we could open them at six from 6 to 8, and then we would probably non-spring use because we don't have fall or winter sports using these fields. So those times of the year, we, we could probably, I would say, open it back up at four o'clock. And so from four to 10, it would be open to public use. And then um, during the spring, because we do have organized track at the, our middle schools, and this is a very popular program for those middle schoolers, we would probably have to extend that at least an hour to five. Mm -hmm. And so it'd go to 5 p.m. then in the spring. So from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. it'd be open. Okay, well, I think given the option, I think I would rather see the minimal closure than I would uh, risk the the situation with a closed corridor. I, I just would feel very uncomfortable. Even, even myself, I'd feel uncomfortable in a closed uh, corridor like that. Um, so I don't think that's unreasonable what is it? that's about what seven eight hours that it would be closed during the day yeah correct so that's that's probably a, a reasonable amount of time to not have access to it and i think the, the public would understand that as well generally our school calendar we call it um about 170 days of school mm -hmm. so yeah. about a 365 day year 170 of those it would be closed for seven yeah. eight hours and generally i think the path would probably be more popular during the summer anyway so mm -hmm. perhaps you'd be surprised though at It'd how be, many people yeah. use the stadium for example uh, all year long uh, yeah. so okay, okay. Right. even with snowmobiles <laughs> a few comments. Um, like many, I agree the fence corridor um, is not a good idea, but um, I also think um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, when you have a corridor type path like that, you're inviting um, camping mm -hmm. and some issues. A paved path mm -hmm. draws um, a different and additional use than like a gravel path like at, Ga you know, at Gaffney or at other areas um, within the city. In terms of lighting, my recollection is the pathway between the high school and um, CCC. That that that's really like non-intrusive, low-level lighting, um, and not like a glaring light per se that yeah, would that. disturb neighbors. Um, I think when I you know walk mm -hmm. my dog through there, <laughs> it's more kind of you know knee ankle height and it's aimed down mm -hmm. as opposed to up, and then it's more bird friendly as well. Um, and then in terms of the locking gates, it sounds like the school district already uses those. Um, I guess um, my concern, I work for Portland Parks and Recreation, and we have locking gates, um, and we have um, a lot of issues um, and of course, a lot yeah. of fires we were trying to put out uh, with people trying um, to find areas at night to sleep at um, that are, you know, not monitored by cameras that don't have use after certain hours. Um, so I guess um, if there were um, school monitors um, that could double check and like ha on a regular plan to actually double check those gates that they're actually mm -hmm. locking, I think we, that would be preventative. Yeah, well, 
We have um, custodial staff on site typically during the school year. Yeah. Um, they're there until about 10 p.m. We intend to not only put locks on these gates, but there'll be um, electronic sensors to tell us where they're at. They're actually if the lock is engaged or not. Mm -hmm. And then that would be their check at when they're checking out the campus at from 9:30 to 10. That'll be one of their security checks before they go home. Would be make sure those gates are locking or locked. And um, and then we could always have people. Uh, we have a pretty extensive uh, security monitoring system that could also monitor those during the night. So if somebody were to breach that gate, it would trigger an alarm. Okay. And then um, okay. if we had a camera pointed out that direction, we could take a look and see if there was actually people running around or not. And then we would dispatch law enforcement. Yeah. And I guess my last comment is I think the width of the path with um, of the, of the um, cement with the gravel on either side, I think that's brilliant. I pick my son up periodically from the middle school and they're always walking in paths. <laughs> so, and then it also helps with mowing um, as well. So anyway. Those are my comments. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, if I can again. Uh -huh. um, you know, I was on the on the board when we talked about the bond and preparing it. You know, a few years ago, and one of the things we talked about a lot was uh, making the space available for community use, whether it be common areas, library, gym, and so um, I commend you for even considering. Mm -hmm a path that the community could use because this being the farthest point from the school, oftentimes it's just, let's not worry about how it looks and we'll just leave it up against the fence. And it's, you know, it's kind of like the deep dark corner of the, of the, of the yard. And so this I think is really good. Um, and I think we were then talking about the fence with the gates locking. I think the gates locking, but without the fence, I think was a great option. Again, I don't think it's our position to require lighting, but I believe and trust the school district's uh, desire to make it safe and comfortable. We'll definitely consider that. Um, the other challenge I have with, with locking some of these uh, gates that go into a corridor is like at Ethel Street. Um, the gate's locked right next to the open driveway. Like, <laughs> they can't get in the gate, they can walk right in the, in the uh, property. In the that, same way the cars go That's actually a pedestrian style vehicle gate, which means it looks okay. like a chain link fence, but it's really a gate. So when it's engaged and locked, it's secured. So okay. you couldn't crawl under it, you have to climb over it. But again, you could climb over all of these perimeter fences because they're six feet except Or go to the other corner and walk through. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At some point. So if somebody wants to get on campus, they're going to get on campus. Yeah. And I think I think the having escape points to me is more of an interest than than the alternative. Um, one thing about that blind corner you mentioned, um, I think just a suggestion, because, you know, I am full of suggestions, Wes. Sure. Um, maybe if, maybe if because of where it's located, mm -hmm. if those shrubs are removed, they aren't. You know, at an entry point, they aren't at a front entrance of a school, but if they're removed, that would increase the visibility prior to turning a corner, and that would increase your safety, I think, right around that corner. That's a good point. So I'll definitely take a look at that. My thoughts. Okay. Tom. I'm not exactly sure what the standard operating procedure is, whether staff participates in the conversations or the deliberations, but I, I would like to share a couple of thoughts if I. Please. Um, first of all, regarding the, the uh, fence corridor, I've, I've racked my brain trying to think of examples of that. I've come up with two. Uh, one is over at Glendevere Golf Course in uh, East Portland. There is a, a fence and then the pathway that goes around you know, the golf course and then there is a, immediately adjacent to that, there's an additional fence. It's not for security, it's for protection. Uh, from golf balls mm -hmm. going through that particular stretch. It's about 200 yards long, and people still use it. People use that trail like crazy. Um, mm -hmm. But I believe that's the exception. The other example I came up with was the Bear Creek Greenway, um, the stretch that runs south of Medford to about uh, a talent, uh, Phoenix. Um, there's about a 300-yard distance that for... Um, private property reasons was fenced on both sides and nobody used that stretch. Um, the trail itself was very heavily used, but when it got to that stretch, rather than people going through it, and it was predominantly because it was just frightening to get in that tight of an area, 
they would go out to uh, Highway 99, go up the sidewalks on their bikes or their skateboards or their rollerblades or walking or jogging, bypass that entire section and then cut through other properties to get back onto the trail. Mm -hmm. It was not successful at all. Yeah, I and I, I would fear that you know, you'd have a similar problem with this. As far as lighting goes, I would uh, suggest that um, this, if the Planning Commission wanted to move that direction, that they would uh, suggest bollard lighting, which is about four feet tall, mm -hmm. um, and it is secure. It's not something you can hit with a bat and break. It's got typically metal rounds around it, mm -hmm. it and it would put off enough low-level light and low intensity that the people on the other side of the fence wouldn't know it even existed. Mm -hmm. So that would solve the, the glare problems associated with that one. That's a good idea. Yeah, the, yeah. the um, you know, the, the other thing, it might be a, another design modification. It does have an interior uh, circulation path and possibility if the schools really wanted to have a fence to put the fence on the other side of that little loop um, trail that's shown there and then extend it along the back side of the track to create a bigger space and create some undulation within that to allow people to move around a little bit more freely. Mm -hmm. The last uh, question I would have is why does the school district uh, feel the need to secure it during track practice or football practice or, or soccer practice? So I can point to about half a million park facilities where kids are playing um, and being coached uh, in open parks now, including parks within Oregon City, that are not secured and fenced um, mm -hmm. during those sessions, whether it's Little League or the youth soccer groups or, or whatnot, whether it's in our parks or Portland's parks or any other parks, you know, they're out there being used. And, and frankly, in my opinion, when you, you have a school located within a neighborhood that doesn't necessarily have a park immediately adjacent to it, that is the park. Mm -hmm. And yes, it does have a big building in it that's occupied, and people understand um, inherently that they should not be out in there during the school hours, but during non-school hours, even if there are sports practices going on, it's fairly generally accepted amongst most people that they can be able to walk across there, stop and enjoy watching the game that's going on during that time, whether they're a parent or you know an older adult within the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So. In my mind, I, I have a hard time following the logic of needing to secure the grounds just because there's a sporting event going on unless you're charging admission to that sporting event. So just my thoughts. Um, I guess at this point, I would want to turn it back to um, Kelly and ask if she's receiving enough input and does she need a formal action? I think Doug had one more comment. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's all right. It's the point you rose. When you have sports activities, uh, are all the kids gone once the activities are there? That is, the adults make sure all the kids are out of there? I mean, that's the only concern I could see if you had some of the kids from the sports activity still hanging in there, no adult supervision, and whether uh, you, you think more of things happening to little kids in elementary school, sure. but but even so. Yeah. Um, I would make the distinction between a community sports activity and a school-sponsored, school-organized um, activity that students can elect to take after school. And so this is what the, that's the program I'm talking about, is after school, the students are, they finish the regular school day, buses will come and take the some most of the students away. About 100 students stay on campus and, and do this after school track program. And then once that's finished, it's heavily supervised by adult, by adult staff. Once that's supervised, they go back to the building. Um, they get their gear and everything. And then there's special activity buses that then come and pick those students up and take them home. And so they are completely supervised on site all the time. And the only other thing I would say about um, sports activities is that people can't choose to come to the school or not come to the school. This is their school. And so they're coming here and dropping their kids off, expecting school to keep them safe. And um, I don't want to even go into what's happening recently. I'm not here to talk about that, what's happened at our high school recently. But I can tell you, I've been on this campus many times over the last two years because we've known this project has been 
coming. And I, every time I'm there and I go outside and you know where the current play structure is, which is sort of like where that blue loop is in the middle, I always see community people who I do not know. And uh, some of them, I don't know, don't know them. And they walk right through kids because they can. And we allow it. We haven't gated that those those gates at all. They're completely open right now. And we're extremely nervous about that. Now, these students are supervised by adults. But we have other strange ad adults who we do not know going through the campus. And so our first and foremost responsibility as school for a school is to keep kids safe. And if kids don't feel safe, you're going to have a hard time teaching them. They're going to have a hard time learning because they're not going to be feeling, they don't feel safe. So that's kind of why we get a little freaked out about safety. But um, at this point, that's why we would want to close the campus off for that. But it, we would open it up as soon as we could for community use. And again, I really want to stress, we, are, we love to make our facilities open to the public. And um, we look forward for these facilities, which are going to be much improved over the previous facilities. When we go into all that, because that's why I'm here. But this is going to be a much improved facility for the community as far as play fields and the ability to exercise and, and, get, on, and get on site and in all kinds of weather. So we're excited about that. Thank you. Chris? Um, just a question. Have you um, seen any kind of feedback from the police department in terms of like preventative measures in your proposal or like how they would respond to an um, active shooter or something like that with these proposals? Yeah. I, um, We'll go into all the details that we do. We actually have a, a, a complete school security audit done of our plans, as well as, um, and then after it's constructed, post-occupancy, there'll be a school security analysis done of the site. And we will do um, training with um, our local P, um, police department with um, how they would respond. We don't get involved in that directly because in those situations, they control the campus. But yeah, they do train, they'll be trained. And um, they'll also, we have a, an SRO that is split between our middle schools. And so he will be, already has been involved in plan review, but he will also be helping other OCPD understand if we have an incident on site, outside on the play fields, how they're going to respond. So, to that. so not just like response, but like this proposal here with like the corridor. Yeah. Idea. Um, yeah, I have met with the police chief a little bit about this, and we have both have construction projects going on, so we share stories. Um, and he's not a fan of the, of the interior fence, but I don't want to speak for him. And that's a secondhand, you know, you could ask for him for an opinion, but generally he doesn't like the corridor idea, as well as putting his officer in a corridor. Mm -hmm. He's not excited about that. And I can understand why we're not excited about the interior fence. Um, so. But we'll do whatever we need to do because we want to support the community. And um, you know, for us, uh, there is some benefit to having it lit early in the morning after 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. and then in the evening hours. So if in the bollards, lighting is a great idea. We didn't do that at the community college because we have a pathway that isn't surrounded by residences. It's open. So, um, but that could be a great solution for lighting the path when it is open to the public. Um, so that's definitely something we could look at. Okay, please go. And then just to jump on what um, Chris was saying, um, I'm assuming that the safety plan that the school district has is similar to a SEPTED, to a crime prevention through yeah, environmental that's one, design We plan. have multiple national standards that we use okay. in our school design. That's one of the main ones, but we have other ones that have been developed, unfortunately, over the last few decades because of, of school shootings and, and violent situations on campuses. Okay, because I would assume in the parks and rec world, um, we live a lot or in yeah. SEPTED, um, yeah. and in terms of um, the light of sight and the lighting, right. um, I would think that would immediately flush out the need for lighting and potentially, depending if these trees and bushes, um, in terms of making sure that the line of sight and the tree lines up yes. mm -hmm. in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We have a very experienced landscape architect who's watching those things for us, but yeah, you're correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Kelly, get what she needs. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I This is extremely helpful, so I really appreciate the discussion. Uh, I don't think that any sort of formal motion or anything is needed. Um, you're more than welcome to, to do that, but um, I think what I would do is just share what I heard with the Planning Commission um, and 
kind of en enter the video of this meeting into the record uh, mm -hmm. for your sure. project sure. Yeah. Um, because it is a it's a quasi-judicial hearing, and so we have to have all the information in the record mm -hmm. in case, yeah. you know, there are appeals and things like that. So um, we would just refer to the video of this meeting, and we wouldn't need any anything else, I don't think. <coughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Very informative. Thank, you. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, we're moving on to back to our agenda, item 5B, the PRAC member position openings and appointment recommendations. So um, my question to the committee is, do we want to have an informal vote? How would we like to handle this? Go down the line. Any suggestions? I suggest every person write down their three choices, three. submit them in. Each one that gets fifty percent on the three gets it. Uh, those, if none of them, if some of them don't get the fifty percent, then we subject them to a more formal process. Everyone good with that? Questions about that first. Um, I have no issues with the process, but. It looks like every every applicant is from a different neighborhood association, so mm -hmm. there's no conflict with that. Mm -hmm. However, what are the neighborhood association or neighborhoods represented here? Mm -hmm. Just to make sure there's no anything we have to be aware of or any conflict. Mm -hmm. So where are we all from? We're not going over two on any of the neighborhoods. No, we're not. That's not my question. My question is, where are each of us from? Which neighbor? I'm from McLaughlin. DC and I are Park Place. Mm -hmm. So two from Park Place, but none here. Gaffney. There's one out there. Yeah, there's one an application the from, from, from Park Place. Okay. But that's okay, given yes, the positions that are going to be open. So that's we're okay. correct. Yeah. Okay, and then Doug, where are you from? Westley Farm. Say again? Westley Farm. Okay. And then... Um, um, they're also uh, associated with South End, but I don't think we have anybody from there. We have, no, not on, not currently. And no. then, I'm sorry. I'm outside. That, okay, I thought we had one. So you're outside, and then, and so that doesn't conflict. Okay, so there is absolutely zero conflict. No, there's no. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah, I'm good with that. Do we have a sheet for that, or just write it down somewhere? I printed one at home. I'll look at you. Just just gonna... consolation. I do not envy your choices here. There's, you had five really well thought thought out candidates that each brought a lot of different right strengths here. and opportunities. You have people with a lot of experience, you have people with children, you have people with that are newer to the community with the fresh eyes. So I don't think you can go wrong on your choices. Yeah, Does everybody have something to write on? Yeah. Here's mine, my ballot. Lisa. And one new paper? I do please. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Paper. Denise. Yeah. So you guys are sticking to three per person, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. If someone's not following directions, we'd like to know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> so far, that was the two I received. Right. They've all it's probably me, actually. Yeah, I was gonna say. Most likely. The light Oops. suspect is. Yeah. <laughs> that get everybody when Chris and got screen. Chris and we got dogs. Yeah, my little one. Oh, but you're leaving that. <laughs> Don't lose the little one. The little ones matter. Little ones are people too. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to take a few minutes if you guys want to take a break or. What if we move on and come back? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can do that. We've had lots of breaks tonight. Um, okay. Item 5C on our agenda Prep goals. 
<laughs> oh, that's me again, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's not a good We could come back. Uh, um, although Troy and Chris could yeah, explain we, it I don't, since yeah. you couldn't find it. <laughs> no, the, yeah, this is this is not you, Don. You don't need to worry about this, I don't think. Or we could jump to member reports. Oh, we do member reports. There you yeah. go. Let's do member reports. Okay. Who'd like to start, left or right? Mr. Uh, Mr. Neely. <laughs> Well, most of my, you know, most things I'm involved with now are associated with the watershed councils and the natural resource committee. And, uh, but I, I took a very nice trip down the Clackamas River. It was one organized by the Metro, Mod Metro, and the Clack and the uh, uh, Clackamas Basin and Watershed Council. And we've got a wonderful river. The Clackamas River is a tremendous oh. river, and. Um, uh, going down it, uh, it's a dynamic river, and if no, nobody's had the opportunity, it is a recreational opportunity for Oregon City to go further up. I didn't know there were so many islands in the river, uh, and uh, and uh, actually on the way, they pointed out where no more than, I think, 2007, where the, uh, the river actually changed course, and they pointed out where it went. <laughs> Uh, closer to 224 at one point, and then now it's further from 224. So dynamic changes occur on that river, and it's nice to have a city that has two rivers. Very cool. Who sponsored that? It, it was. It, it was. I should say more specifically, but it is the Clackamas River Basin Watershed Council, and also the Metro. Uh, Met our representative from Metro and the Open Spaces piece. Yes. Chris. Um, I really don't have anything, just um, some parting comments. I just I've really appreciated and enjoyed my time working on the committee. And uh, I've worked with a lot of different personalities and um, ideas, and, and it's really been interesting and um, educational, and I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Who's here? Nothing to comment. OK. Jeff. One of my other uh, volunteer positions is with the Clackamas County Aging Services Council. And we've had a couple of meetings here recently uh, centered on behavioral health. And I was really quite surprised to find out that the number three killer uh, is loneliness. Uh, congestive heart failure is number one, diabetes number two, and loneliness is the number three killer. But the, the thing that really distressed me the most, and I, you know, being on Aging Services Council, I would have thought that it's the boomer generation and what have you that suffers the most from loneliness. No, it's not. It's gen gen Generation Z, our children, are higher at higher risk for suicide through loneliness than any other age group. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that is because of the tendency of our uh, younger generations to be more involved with their electronics than they are with outdoor activities and, and social face-to-face, uh, -face, hand hand-to-hand embracing activities. And I think that that is um, one of the things that I'm really delighted to be involved with both the Aging Services Council and Behavioral Health and this council is that I think those two things really dovetail with each other. We can, we can do a lot um, to um, modify, take care of this problem of loneliness through parks and recreation. Uh, for getting people together, getting them active, uh, getting them to socialize, and uh, uh, maybe dropping that suicide rate. Oregon is very high yeah. in suicide rate. Jeff, those are really great comments. Thank you. It's, just, yeah, it's, it's eye opener too, as well. Um, well, speaking for myself, this is my last meeting. It's been a great three years, and thank you all, everyone, each and every one of you. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll be remaining with Oregon City Parks Foundation. So hopefully we can develop partnerships as we move forward. So just thank you for everyone. Appreciate it. Derek. I wanted to 
thank everyone, you know, Lisa and Chris and you know, the folks that are leaving that, you know, to that segued me in here and taught me everything I know in the last <laughs> 10 months, not including Karen. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, Parkways, uh, I checked out Promenade. I, I, I can't remember if I even said that. What a neat area, you know, what a view from there, mm -hmm. you know. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, you know, honestly didn't know that kind of like little narrow thing existed, but uh, but other than that, that's about where I'm at. Okay. And I'm going to miss you mm -hmm. and Chris. <laughs> um, Saturday, November 16th at the cemetery, Doug joined us. Um, the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War did a memorial ceremony because it was two days before the dedication of the cemetery at Gettysburg. And they have a gentleman that does a fantastic Lincoln imitation who read the Gettysburg Address. But the ceremony was the culmination of marking unmarked Civil War veterans' graves at the cemetery. We have placed all the headstones. Uh, Sons of Union veterans are wonderful. They um, order them. They put them in. Everything's done. Wow. Uh, so every Civil War veteran at Mountain View Cemetery is now marked in some way, either private or military headstone. Oh, great. And now I'm looking at other wars. <laughs> but um, also thanks to Marjorie Harding, who originally introduced me to the Sons of the Union veterans. They got a hold of uh, Raymond Rendleman, Rendleman at the Oregon City News, and he did a beautiful article. And there was probably 50 people no. there in addition to the members of the organization. Joyce was there, and Doug was there. Um, so that was the big we had at one of those ceremonies. Yeah. So things move ahead up there. I miss that. Thank you. I have nothing. Nothing? Okay. On, you know me. I'm always over here quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> can, I, can I make a comment? <laughs> Jeff, you know, before the trees grew higher, you actually had a view of the uh, waterfall from that site. Yes. And uh, every once in a while, I wonder if... if and it's something we might, we might want to weigh in at one point, whether there should be some selective cutting of trees in our parkland that will give us a view. Concerned about the Mountain View Cemetery, we do have a mountain view, but it's... We used to. Well, that's the point. I mean, you can get to certain points where yes. you can see it, but you could see it from, I think, the mausoleum before. I'm not sure you can anymore. So, so I'm, I'm not suggesting what should be cut, but I'm suggesting it might be a topic of discussion. Are there certain scenic views that we've lost that might be brought back with some very, very selective cutting of trees? And those trees can actually become part of the environment they are, providing, you know, uh, a habitat for critters that live under logs and so forth. Uh, so that might be something, it's not on our goals, but that might be something we want to consider. When ODOT scaled from the tunnel south, I asked John Lewis and Phil about the face of the bluff there. Mm -hmm. And there was kind of a, well, it's them, it's them, it's the railroad, and it turned out that no, it's park property. But the reason that ODOT did the tree removal is because it's dangerous on that basalt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I suggested that, you know, we really need to look at that face on both sides of the elevator and selectively remove some of the trees. Well, maybe sh we should put that in the, the goal. Add it to a goal. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a because yeah, it's, it, we're going to end up with basalt on a train. I understand the, uh, Steps are closed again. Mm -hmm. So well, I walked them the other day. They they were working, so they're they're open. The uh, workmen were working. But there's rocks falling on your head. <laughs> <laughs> Just look up. That's fine. fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So we have more stuff to do. Remember when we're doing our goals next year. Then. <laughs> so do we have results? Yes. And uh, the three that were selected. Uh, based on the tallies that I, you know, I, I did on here, uh, Sean, uh, Sean Dackler, mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. Andy Crum, and Brett Haverkamp. 
Did they get 50%? We're, we're the highest vote getters. Yes. They all got 50% of the votes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, Brett had Brett had five votes. Uh, Andy had six, and Sean had eight. Wow. That's wow. good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Would you like to put that into a motion for me? Yes. Um, I'll move that the uh, that slate three has been voted in. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Uh, bear in mind, it's a recommendation to the mayor for yes. appointment. Yes. 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 Correct. yes. Okay. Uh, I think we can just simply do. Uh, a, he has to do roll call. Do we need? Okay. Roll call. Oh, is that so what we need to, yeah. Okay. I. Christopher. I. Alicia. I. Jeff. I. Lisa. I. Derek. I. Karen. I. Troy. Aye. Let the record show unanimous. Okay. We've covered that. Um, crack Golds. You know, one of the things, because I am here for a relatively short time, um, one of the things that I've, I've tried to do or taking a look at doing is, is considering my time here, kind of a, a two-pronged mission, one of, of, of which is to uh, work on being that um, bridge between Phil and whoever the next person is, and, and trying to put together a plan for that smooth transition, if you will, between the two uh, directors. Um, and that, that kind of falls into a couple of different categories, a smooth transition for staff, a smooth transition for the community, and a smooth transition for the PRAC, um, but also a smooth transition for that director who's coming on board. One of the things that I think would be very helpful in doing that uh, for that director is to be able to, on their first day, be able to come in and have a clearly defined set of goals that the PRAC is working towards. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was to try and find those goals. So I went back um, through, I found the ones that were attached uh, to the document that were shown in January. I took a look at all the different um, agendas, trying to find, well, where do they adopt these goals? And I, I honestly couldn't find them. They resurfaced again in September. Um, and so I wanted to put them back in front of you and ask how you want staff to proceed with these. I also, you know, selfishly, want to do the best job I can do on your behalf. And in order to do that, I need to develop my own work plans um, that will fit your needs. And so I'm not just asking about the transition part now, I'm asking about how I can best fit your needs and how I can best, um, in the time I'm here, move those balls as far forward as possible. So on, for my sake, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point um, we can finalize those goals in the next uh, meeting or two, unless you know you have a, a way of telling me how you want to move forward with them. I'll start, and thank you for that, Don. I strongly recommend that we revisit this in January with the new committee. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And the, so with the document that's attached to the agenda here is not what no, we, we, we submitted to Phil. Mm -hmm. um, and you want me to give the background on that for Don? Yeah, so what we did, Don, um, Troy and I were tasked with looking at the, the current goals um, and coming up with a format that's a little bit more um, user-friendly and gives us a way of tracking Okay. Um, where we're at with them and, and including measures of success so that this is out on the public website. It's not just a list of goals. It actually shows where we're at with them and, and uh, up-to-date notes on, on what needs to be done or where we're at with the individual goals. So um, could you send that to me? Yeah, uh, sure. I'll, I'll do that if you okay. want. Okay. Uh, because we had been working on it, and I then you clearly don't have what Phil has or I had. Do. So we can get that to you. And so the goals, we've already approved the goals that you have there. But we, in the discussion in September is where it came up that 
some of us weren't comfortable with the format because it wasn't trackable. Okay. And so they were more of ideas versus, yes, it was done. And to, to Chris's point, if we're going to tell the public what we're going to do, they should be able to hold us accountable to doing that. Um, and so we, so Chris and I were working on the format, not the goals themselves, not changing anything that the, the, that we all wanted, but just the format and then bring that back through Phil. And then, um, just basically approving the format, making sure everyone's clear on it without changing the goals. And then to Lisa's point, we also had in the past reviewed those about every year, but we had, I think it was this also the September meeting, but at some point we had asked Phil to continue to put that on the agenda. I don't think we said every meeting, but I think we agreed if I'm not mistaken, every quarter, every quarter. Um, because the problem we had is we forget about them and talk about them every year. Mm -hmm. And then we look back and we haven't done any of them because we kind of forgot we even had them. Right. And so the idea was bring them back about once a quarter see how we're doing, maybe take some off if they're done. We had some at the bottom that were also more of just priorities but not goals. Maybe it's time to move those up because, um, you know, maybe a master plan is now done. This can be sure. part of the goal, you know, whatever. Some of them maybe would get moved down just depending on what we discussed. And so the idea is bring them back every quarter. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah see, forward with me that. I, yeah. Yeah. Phil did a great job of laying out a lot of information oh, yeah. for me. Unfortunately, it's... Um, Sometimes things get overlooked. Sure. No, that's fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we can say, because we worked on the format. Like I said, we didn't change any goals, but we'd work on the format, and then we can put that in the agenda to, that would be to talk about it in January. And one clarification. There are two-year goals. We're on the bottom yes. with okay. the city. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and just to, to add on that, um, you know, we talked about we want um, visibility for the public to see what we're working on and how we're doing on that. And, and have them hold us accountable. But I would also expect uh, the mayor and, and the commission to do the same thing, is to check in on our goals and see where we're at. And are we doing our job? Are we seeing success? And if not, ask why. So I, I think it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. There's nothing else on that topic. We'll jump a little bit to item seven, staff reports. And 7A, the Tyrone Woods Memorial Park. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that uh, the plans have been submitted to the planning department for their review and approvals. Um, we'll be able to move into permitting uh, fairly quickly once that is complete. Um, receive those permits. Uh, we'll also be going out, our uh, desire is to go out early next year for bidding on the construction of the, the project. One of the questions that, that I've been asked by um, or Chair Lisa, was why did it grind to a halt for a while? Mm -hmm. um, I have spent some time talking to a number of people, looking at a, a few different things, and while I don't have a definitive answer for you, I do have um, some things that, that uh, maybe could have been managed a little bit differently uh, that would account for a, a certain amount of time lag uh, within the project itself. Okay. And I think one of the, the things that was probably the most startling um, that I, I found was when the budget was prepared, when the grants were requested, when the contract was let for the design team, when the, you know, the initial design was done and moved on and all the way up to the 80% design, the assumption was that the park would be responsible for um, doing the half street improvements on two of the three streets. It became evident at a certain point that the street improvements needed to be made on all three sides of the park. At that point, uh, the project was not adequately funded. Um, and so I believe at that point, Phil kind of put the brakes on the project or slowed the project down, trying to figure out what, what to do, how to proceed now whether that was relayed on to the, the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee, I don't know. But from what I can see, that was one of the biggest drags on the, on the, the procedure. My direction to the architect, we were at 80% completion on the drawings when I came on board, was to get the drawings done as quickly as possible. That we want to move forward with the bidding, and when we do that bidding, we're going to need to do it in such a way that allows for potential phasing of the construction of the park. Okay. So we're going to develop a, a bid package that will come out in kind of the old smorgasbord style or the option style that, that, that will allow for the, the bidders to be able to assign a, a dollar value for each of the primary 
larger elements, whether that's the, the dog park or the shelter or, or the different you know, elements to go with it. That is what needs to be done. And then only after we have that information will, will we be able to make logical choices to say, yeah, given all the physical requirements we absolutely have to do, such as the street improvements, these are the things that are left over that we can do with the funds that we have and complete those tasks and move on and get that park built and then begin the next phases as, as we can find that, that money to move forward with. The other thing that, that I think that uh, maybe we as staff have lacked on that, that project is the management of expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes people make the assumption that just because, you know, there's funding available, there's land available, boy, we can build that park, you know, real, real quickly. And, and sometimes the reality is just the opposite of that. It, it does take time. Yet the community gets ahead um, and we don't necessarily do a good enough job of explaining what all the different steps are and how long each of those steps really, really take. You know, when, when the master plan is done, there's the expectation of, oh, we'll be able to build the park right away. Uh, not necessarily the case, because after that, you have to start developing your construction documents. And then once those are done, you have to start developing your bid package. I've seen some nodding heads from somebody that's been down this road before. Yeah. And then once those those are done, you can actually move forward. And then sometimes you have to do the value engineering. And in this case, because of the naming situation, it, my sense is that it became a very emotional um, life of its own, uh, so to speak. And you had the the other group, the outside group, the VFW, that were very excited about it, and rightfully so, and going out and doing fundraising. And, and frankly, their pace outpaced our pace. And as a result, I think that's where some of that friction came into place. And, and the best way to describe it is just simply, I don't think we did a good job as staff of managing those expectations and those timelines. So and realistic explaining what schedule. those really are. Yeah. So, so, I will do my best to make sure to keep you all well informed as to what those timelines are and what those expectations are. And, and we will do an update every, every time that we get a significant piece to the puzzle. We'll send out information to you. We'll report during the meetings themselves and we'll keep you informed along the way. And I will make contact with the VFW and make sure that they understand that too. Thank you, Don. That's really, really helpful. Um, so, a I realistic have some, I have some comments I want to get out. Yeah. <laughs> you so, um, <coughs> trying to think where to start and not to be too blunt, but um, in my line of work, we, we use a tool called a retrospective after a large project. It's very useful to sit down, talk about the things that went well, mm -hmm. talk about the things that didn't go well, mm -hmm. and how do we make sure it doesn't, the, the things that didn't go well happen again. I strongly encourage this group to have a retrospective on this, this process, mm -hmm. because um, right now we don't do things very well as a city, as a city in terms of planning and execution um, from what I've seen. Um, there was a lack of transparency, a lack of communication, and frankly, a, a lack of accountability during this process. Um, and when, when the story hit the press recently, I was embarrassed. I really was. Um, I, I really appreciate your comments, Don, and I, and I have a lot of confidence in you, and, and you're saying the right things. I would love to see that happen, but we can't do this again. This, this was not a good process. This, this whole street thing, this first I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I and it's not your fault. I, I, I understand. Apologize um, <laughs> on behalf of staff. Yeah, but it's current and it's past. one of it's one of a laundry list of things that we didn't know about yeah. or hear about. And and the fact I think the last straw for me was when we we heard that the uh, grant money was not used and had to be uh, submitted for a an extension, which was risky. Successful. But yes, there is risk. always a risk. So anyway, I would encourage a retrospective as this group, maybe a, a work session outside of a meeting, and just talk about things that went well. Sean has a lot of history that he can bring, a lot of communications and conversations that he had, and, and he and I had with, with uh, commission and the mayor. Um, but I think that would be eye-opening and, and useful for the future. So I that's agree. it. I'm done. Good comment. Lisa, man. Yeah. <clears throat> 
thank you for the transparency. That's the best we've gotten ever. Yeah. And you're the new guy. <laughs> like, this is good. Um, new guy here. Well, you knew. Thank you. Been yes. around for a while. No, and we and we appreciate. I mean, that that's I appreciate the transparency. Um, and you had mentioned kind of the VFW. Chris said uh, Sean, and so just to clarify, that Sean Dashler, mm -hmm. who was an applicant, uh, was on PRAC before, was on the naming committee for Tyrone Woods, is a member of the VFW, Perfect. and is very passionate about this. So from all from many sides of this coin, Sean is your guy to talk to, and he'll kind of spearhead it from the VFW side, and he. You'll hear in his voice, he's very passionate about this, sure. so he's probably your guy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anthony, Thank you. other oh. questions or comments regarding this topic? Thank you again. No problem. Appreciate it. All right, moving on to item eight, future agenda items. Item eight, eight A, list of future agenda items. Any comments on this? Questions? Can I make a comment regarding this? Please. Um, when I put the agenda together, and again, sorry about the double-sided, double duplicate. Um, the way I looked at these, and then, again, this is from my perspective, and the way I've worked in the past, is even though I don't intend to speak about each of these projects tonight, frac Frankly, I don't plan on speaking about any of them other than the, what I just did with the, the Tyrone Woods Memorial Park. One of the things I heard was the loss of continuity in these projects, the loss of continuity and communication regarding these projects or the ability to these projects. I think somebody said, gee, we hear about it in January or February, and we say we'll deal with that in, in uh, September, and somewhere between that point and that point, it falls off the table. What I'm trying to do is create a table so it doesn't fall off. So what, when I have these on here, this is an opportunity, again, in, in my past experience, for you guys to put date certain on those, to ask you know, for updates or say we want to talk about it then. And if you tell me that you want to talk about the, um, uh, the Buena Vista house in September, we will write right after that <laughs> on the agenda between now and the date that you pick for that the date that we're gonna talk about that park. Mm -hmm. And so that we will have it out there for everybody to see, you, me, the next director, when that's gonna be back on for discussion. And we will make sure that we don't lose those things off the table. Great, idea. thank you. I've got a request, uh, sure. not, not on these items, although I have a question and an item, but it gives an example. Um, one of the commissioners put forward a motion to give a certain amount of uh, funds to the Buena Vista House. Not only did that not come to us, it was brought up at a meeting that was not on the agenda. And uh, uh, I talked to the previous, uh, our, our previous director, and he said anytime something comes up that it should involve a prac, and somebody's gonna try to take action on it, that you say that you, this ought to go to the advisory committee first. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's really difficult for us to have these things come up and we, we weren't part of the process. Um, and then that's not saying the decisions the commission made were wrong. I'm not making right, any, right. Any, any comment on that whatsoever. Another thing that I would like to have come up, uh, we just all learned, I think, recently that the, um, the COVE project is essentially funding its whole through. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, the like Clackamas Cove project uh, oh, okay. the development there. Sure. But what I'd like to have some discussion of is this thing. It, it, you know, the process is going to continue on. Um, that that Cove, uh, that Cove project, the whole Cove, that whole area there, including the Cove itself, was procured many years ago in the, in the late '90s, actually, with uh, by Urban Renewal, so it belongs to the Urban Renewal District. I, w I would like to see a discussion that once that development occurs, then the lands actually become park lands. The, co the cove itself, the the period areas around the bank actually become a part of, of, of our park system. Because I don't think there's any identification of how that land is going, what what's going to happen to it once the development has occurred. And so that's one thing I'd like to see a discussion of at one point. 
Okay. And since this deal has followed through, perhaps it's a good time to bring it up as the commission try it. Well, I should say the Urban Renewal Commission tries to figure out uh, its next steps in the process. I think one of the things that would be helpful for staff is for us to develop a way of, of adding to this list. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and I don't mean any offense by this, um, but sometimes what is one person's um, desire to talk about a, a project or a place or a situation doesn't necessarily match the needs of, right. of all the members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, from my previous experience, uh, in order to add things to topics of the agenda or to you know get things scheduled on there, we would require one of a couple of things. One would be a request from the, the chair to you know add to the agenda, um, or in this case the the uh, ongoing portion of the agenda, or to have a, a uh, two members make that request directly to the director. That's how I had done it in, in Ashland. Now, whatever way we want to do it is, is fine by me, but I just want to make sure that that when we're adding things to the agenda, it's not just, just my opinion or, or you know one other member's opinion of it. It has a certain process that goes through. That way we can keep our, our meetings in a reasonably streamlined fashion to move forward. Now, one of the things, and I don't know, and I'm sure Phil has, has done this in the past, but one of the things that I've always pride myself on is when I get ready to set the agenda, I try and contact the chair and the vice chair and talk a little bit about what needs to go onto those agendas and, and why. And I did this time mm -hmm. uh, with did. the chair and the vice mm -hmm. chair. I spent time talking about uh, what needs to go on. I put together the agenda and then staff uh, person who was reviewing it and helping me with, with some things pointed out a couple of points to it. And so I made a couple of minor options and I tried to reach back out and, and say, well, gee, you'll notice that, that there is no approval of minutes on this. <laughs> and the reason why is I'm trying to find the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I just today, this afternoon, I got access to Phil's H drive, and I'm reasonably certain that I'm going to find some minutes in there. <laughs> but until then, that's, that's where it is. So anyway, I, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there and let you know um, that, that I, I am listening. I am writing down. I am keeping track. But I also need to make sure that what I put on this agenda. Um, yeah, I was talking about a, as a future agenda item, an additional future agenda yeah. item. I appreciate that. Uh, on boards that I've been on in the past, it's worked the same way. It goes through the through the chair. Okay. Um, I think that makes sense because I know there's times that um, the agenda can appear a little bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. But this is a way to keep the chair in the loop. Mm -hmm. right. uh, there's going to be th some things that come from staff, right? But anything that's not coming from staff, I think should go through the chair. It's not a lot of work for the chair to take a look at that email that I send her, and she forwards and says, Don, please add this, and CC me, thanks, Troy, and that's it. That doesn't take much. Uh, but that way, she's kind of in the loop. So when she shows up with the agenda, she's like, yep, I remember these things. We talked about them. Mm -hmm. I think that helps. Yeah. yeah. I guess my last comment also is my door is always open. Just give me a call. I'd love to sit down. I enjoy a good cup of coffee. And so anytime anybody wants to have a cup or just want to talk about something, just give me a holler. I'll get some time and uh, be happy to sit down. And <coughs> so thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? I don't see the Pratt goals on this future agenda item. So maybe we should add that. Yes. So yes. We just talked about it, right? Good point. Yeah. And we will I add assume that. I assume January. a future agenda item will be voting for a new chair. <laughs> <laughs> really? Not everything will, yes. will need to be on the future yeah. agenda yeah. items, of course. Yeah. Well, and I, just one question. Property acquisition makes me slightly uncomfortable on the future agenda, since that's usually executive session. Yeah, well. Until everything's blessed. Yes, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. I would never list a specific property. Is dog park a separate item or is that a sub? It just got indented by accident. Okay, no, so that was... No, we're buying properties yeah. for dog park. That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> that's what I'm wondering. It's... Yeah, I, that's a typo. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> just want to make sure we're clear. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a half bug. <laughs> this finger right there. So it's not property acquisition for dog park. No, okay. no that's a low little finger problem. Crack is officially going to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not the best type. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> if there's nothing else, any other questions, comments? Thanks to everyone.
really appreciate it. Meeting adjourned.